Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a teacher from the art centre and a female student's father about her art courses. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon. May I speak to Emma's parent? Afternoon. I'm her father. Who am I speaking to? This is Emma's teacher, Jane Carson, calling from the Arts Centre. I'm just calling to talk about her drama class at the centre. Oh, thank you for calling. How's Emma doing in drama class? You know, she just transferred here last month, unlike the others in her class who have been taking the course the whole semester since June. So I'm a bit worried that she might not fit in so well. The father says his daughter Emma has been taking the course since last month, so C has been circled as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good afternoon. May I speak to Emma's parent? Afternoon. I'm her father. Who am I speaking to? This is Emma's teacher, Jane Carson, calling from the Arts Centre. I'm just calling to talk about her drama class at the centre. Oh, thank you for calling. How's Emma doing in drama class? You know, she just transferred here last month, unlike the others in her class who have been taking the course the whole semester since June. So I'm a bit worried that she might not fit in so well. There's no need to worry. She exhibits a strong performance in her drama class. Is that so? Yes. She didn't adapt to the new environment as quickly as I originally expected and seemed a bit shy at first. But a few days later, she made a couple of friends and became more talkative and also more involved in class. Emma really is a role model for others because she has always been an active participant during class. She voices her own ideas and is very creative. I didn't expect that, but I can tell that she really enjoys the course because she's been talking about it at home frequently these past few weeks. That's great to hear. Interest is always the best teacher. I also have to inform you that there's been an adjustment in the timetable of the drama class next term. Why is that? It's not that the music room that we currently use isn't available, as there are too many enrolling for the coming semester. Increased class size means that space is limited to house the whole class. Also, the new classroom we use is not available during the current time frame, so I'm afraid we have to change the time for it. I see. So when would it be? As you know, the current class begins at 3.15, but the new time of the drama class would be a quarter to five. I'm afraid I have errands to run during that time. On the other campus, the class still begins at 3.15, but for the campus Emma goes to, it is the only time available for drama class. Oh, I see. I have to make adjustments to my core schedule then. No problem. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Miss Carson, I'm thinking about signing Emma up for another art course. I'm thinking about dance class. Dance class is a popular course here, a great choice for a child to shape up and have fun. But unfortunately, it is oversubscribed at the moment. I have to put you on the waiting list. That's too bad. What else can I choose from then? Could you give me some advice? 
class as well. This would improve her musicality. Sounds good. When is that? It is held every Friday evening. That's too bad. Emma already has a swimming class earlier that evening. It will be too late for her to come home if she takes this course. There is also a vocal course available. Emma's got a great voice. I'm sure she'll stand out in the class. Tell me about it. The vocal course starts at 4.30pm every Tuesday. It isn't fully booked yet. Great teacher, experienced and beloved by students. The price is a bit higher, though. How much is it? It's $110. Oh, that's too much. Way over our budget. We have to cover the extra cost if we choose it. Or maybe Emma could take music class. What is it about? Learning about songs and musicals? Well, the students have the opportunity to play different instruments like the piano, drum and so on. They can also learn to write music under professional guidance. That's exactly what Emma is eager to learn. How much would it cost? It was $63 last term, but this term it is $85. $22 more than the original price. We can afford that. When does the course begin? The course starts on September the 7th. Can we start one week later, on September the 14th? My daughter will be on a trip to France with her mum on the 7th. No problem. And the teacher for the class is Jamal Curtis. Just contact him if you have any further questions regarding the course. Jamal Curtis? How do you say Curtis? Oh, it's C-U-R-T-I-S. Thank you. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a talk about the Women's Conference. First look at questions 10 to 14. As you listen to part of the talk, answer questions 10 to 14. There will be two meetings held in Beijing, and they will overlap. 1. The NGO, Non-Governmental Organization Forum on Women, will be held in Beijing from August the 30th to September the 8th, 1995. The other one, the Fourth World Conference on Women, FWCW, of the United Nations, will be held in Beijing from September the 4th to the 15th, 1995. Why is the UN, United Nations, holding these meetings? The UN has noticed that discrimination against women has been increasing. The UN definition of discrimination, any distinction, exclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the purpose of deciding or not, allowing the full recognition of a woman on the basis of equality between male and female, human rights, freedom in political, economic, social, cultural or other fields. Women are discriminated against in every country of the world. The UN has issued policies to deal with the discrimination. The UN has also placed the improvement of women's status position high on the global agenda. The world is getting smaller. We are becoming a global family that shares problems and difficulties. We can learn from one another, help one another, and share ideas and information. There have been three previous World Conferences on Women, first in Mexico City in 1975, second in Copenhagen in 1980, and third was in Nairobi in 1985. During the first conference held in Mexico City in 1975, which was during the International Women's Year, one outcome was the declaration by the UN General Assembly 
for Decade for Women, 1976 to 1985. In Copenhagen in 1980, the participants adopted a program of action for the second half of the UN Decade for Women. The 1985 Nairobi Conference was held at the end of the UN Decade for Women, and the results were published in a book called The Forward-Looking Strategies, which provided a framework for action at the international, national and regional levels of government and groups to promote greater equality and opportunities for women. The slogan for the UN Decade for Women was Equality, Development and Peace. This year, from the end of August until the middle of September, Beijing will hold two conferences. They are separate conferences, but related. The NGO Forum 95, from August the 30th to September the 8th, about 30,000 participants, both women and men, are expected to attend. It will be about women, their lives and their perspectives. This will provide women around the world with an opportunity to discuss and develop ideas, perspectives, plans and strategies and share information to celebrate women's achievement and contributions in society and to draw attention to and develop solutions to the discrimination facing women worldwide. Who can participate in the NGO Forum 95? Any individuals or groups who fill in an application form and send 50 US dollars to NGO Forum, New York, by April 30, 1995, who will attend the fourth World Conference. Each member state of the UN will send an official delegation. There are 184 member states in the UN. Also, any person that represents an organization which has received accreditation. This had to be done by January 13, 1995. 6,000 people are expected to attend this conference. There has been over three years of preparations for this conference in Beijing at the international, national and regional levels in all the participating countries. The Preparation Committee has organised all the issues into ten categories. The conference in Beijing will discuss all these issues. At the end of the conference, the UN will issue a Platform for Action. The Platform for Action will address the following critical areas of concern. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Listen to the Listen to the following directions and answer questions 15 to 20. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome to this afternoon's tour of the campus. I'll be your guide for the duration. Before we start, could I please ask you to look at your campus map? That's the one you just got when you came in. Because the university buildings are not quite spread out, the tour will be on foot. Now. Let's start where we are, the main building. As you come out of the main building, you will see two other big buildings opposite you. One is the campus branch of the Midland Bank on your left. The other one is the post office. Then we will follow the Mary's Road until we come to the school lane. Here, on the opposite side of the road, you will see a huge white building directly on your left-hand corner. That would be the student's library. The student union is next to it opposite the bank. Then we turn right and get into Candle Lane. There is a big shopping centre directly on the corner and the science building is on the left hand side. As we go down Candle Lane, past the shopping centre, we come to the school bookstore which has a good reputation. All necessary course books can be bought there. Not the one next to the shopping centre but the one after that on the high street. Opposite the bookstore there is the sports centre which takes up the whole block between Mary's Road and Candle Lane on the High Street. Finally, we circle back to the main building. The tour will last about an hour and a half. I hope you will enjoy this afternoon's tour.
Oh, one more important note from Mr. Smith, your director. Please be back to this main building after the tour. There will be a reception at 5.30 in room 204 on the first floor in the lecture hall. You'll meet your teachers and staff there. All of you are welcome. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a student called Pete talking to his classmate Dave about the presentation that he will give on environmental science. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Are you just leaving the library now? I saw you get there at 8 a.m. Yeah, I've been there all day. What for? They hire a cute new librarian or something? I wish. No, it's the presentation that I will give in environmental science the day after tomorrow. What's it about? I heard you were really excited about the class. And Dr. Schnee also calls you for the arcane questions, as he calls them. It's about environmental damage in the Yucatan. Excuse me, what? Or is that where? The Yucatan. It's a state in southeast Mexico. So what's happening there? Agriculture is having a really adverse impact on the environment. There are too many farmers doing too much farming. It's really destroying the forests and ruining the soil. Deforestation is a major problem there now. How did you learn about this? I don't recall Dr. Schnee saying anything about it in lecture. Yes, but my brother went there last month. You know, to look at the old cities like the Maya Indians built. That's what first got me interested. Your brother Tom? No, Dick, Harry's twin. Anyway, he told me how few trees there were now and how much empty ground that grows almost nothing. He said the place looked more like the desert than jungle in some parts. It brought environmental damage, so I started looking for materials in the library. Here, look at this magazine. What's in it? It's an old issue of National Geographic. It includes interviews with tourists who have been there in the past few years. It's pretty bad. See the photos? I see the photos, but one or two photos don't prove anything. Then read what the article says. Right there. The first thing it points out is how soil samples show it's hard for anything to grow there. It says how an area of 21,000 square kilometres has lost most of its forest in the past 10 years. See, there are graphs. As the number of farmers increases, the acres of forest have decreased. It's an inverse relation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, how big is that state? I'm sorry, but I've never really learned the metric system. It's bigger than the state of Massachusetts. That's shocking. Anything else? There's lots of else. Scientists say there's a growing area of about 10.5 square kilometers where nothing can grow at all. It's like the beginning of a desert. Oh, yes. What Dr. Schnee called is certification. But why can't anything grow there? I've never really studied soil chemistry. I'm just starting to look into that subject, but my sister, Marie, is a geologist, and she says the problem is that the soil has too much saline, with no plants helping to adjust the chemistry. Apparently, that's a common problem with soil types throughout the areas with rainforest. Once you lose the plant cover, it's difficult to bring it back. 
reforestation is almost impossible, even if the land is not being used for other purposes. Wait a minute. What is saline? Saline is salt dissolved in water. Scientists who have gone there have taken measurements. They do this by gathering a sample of the soil and running a simple test that shows the ionization of the solution. The geology department in our own university has reviewed the soil at the site too. They're right. It looks pretty bad. The level of salinity is going up, but the plants that would solve that problem can't be planted in soil like that. There is a narrow spectrum of salinity in which the plants will grow. And once you pass the threshold, there is no way to put the problem right. Exactly. It's possible that no one can do anything to stop the trend now, and all because of human greed. I wait a second. How do you know these scientists can be trusted? What kind of reputation do they have? Are they reliable? Oh, they're definitely reliable. They include four members of the faculty from the geology department right here at MIT. Here, study these photographs and check the damage yourself. That's what Dr. Horst, who wrote the book here, did. He's newly appointed, but Dr. Schnitt said that he's brilliant. So, where are you going now? I'm headed over to the geography department to borrow a map for my presentation. You know, this whole problem could have been avoided. The farmers there in the Yucatan. Uh, Pete. What? Go take a break. Leave some studying for the rest of us. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on managing creativity in business. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everyone. The topic of today's management lecture is managing creativity in your business, and believe me, this is one of the toughest tasks that any manager has to face. How do you lead and control the staff whose job it is to create new business and product ideas for you? They are the ones full of creativity and imagination. So they need to have a lot of freedom. After all, they are the people who are paid to come up with new ideas. Controlling staff who are at the forefront of innovation will be one of your most challenging tasks. After all, creativity implies freedom of thought and action. Management styles used to be different, especially in manufacturing. In the factory, staff would be told what to do and how to do it. With a watchful eye kept on them, in that setting, standardization was important for efficiency and product quality. Work could be exceptionally boring, and there was no place for individuality. Now, of course, robots have taken over many of the exacting, repetitive tasks. Nowadays, we employ far more people to generate business than to manufacture products. It's very competitive out there. Innovation—that's what our modern consumer craves. Successful companies have got the message: we need lots of new ideas, and now we employ bright young minds to come up with them. However, these ideas have to be implemented to make a change to our profits, so we have to find staff with entrepreneurial flair, and be ready to listen to them and support them to follow through on their ideas. We need to supervise without stemming the flow of ideas or sending the brightest minds to work for the opposition. 
Creative people won't welcome us always looking over their shoulder and checking up on what they are doing. One of the most common ways that management handles this problem of keeping people working along company lines is by establishing achievement targets like money earned, products developed, or clients gained. These targets are a useful guideline, but they have a downside. Young, enthusiastic staff will be very keen to meet these targets, and some of them might potentially use illegal means or behave unethically in order to meet requirements. For example, by offering bribes to gain sales, or making their sales numbers or earnings look higher than they are, or even threatening or criticizing other staff to get a job completed. Achievement targets are often linked directly to performance bonuses, and this can make a bad situation worse. So as you can see, the standard management techniques can create inherent problems both for the individual and for the company. More recent theorists suggest new tactics for managers. Robert Simons, writing in the Harvard Business Review, has added some new concepts to the thorny problem of encouraging creativity while maintaining a viable business. He suggests three control levers to assist in getting positive creative contributions from the workforce. Remember, and this is the point, we want creativity, wild, vibrant creativity to compete in the marketplace. Yet we must be careful to keep people on track, sticking to our core business and maintaining the company's reputation. The first of his levers is getting the workers actively involved in the central ethos of the business. One of the most common ways to do this is to create a mission statement. But along with that, many businesses have some kind of motto, which summarizes their key idea. For example, the most durable tools in the world, or perhaps the customer comes first. Whatever it is, you'll want your bright minds to believe it and act on it. So Robert Simons suggests that it should be developed with staff input, letting them feel like part of the operation. After all, their jobs depend on it. A second lever was once described by Charles Christensen, professor at Harvard Business School, as the power of negative thinking. You can't continually instruct your creative minds on what they should do. They are meant to be inventing, leading, not following, and telling them what to do is counterproductive. But you can tell them what not to do, which potential products are not related to the company's objectives, or which strategies or behaviors are unacceptable. This is a tactical ploy to maintain the company's integrity. It's absolutely vital to establish boundaries to assist in controlling innovation without suppressing it. The third lever is basically sitting down with your crew to share ideas about the business. As manager, your duty is to stay abreast of the external factors such as who's competing in your market, how well is the company doing this month, and are you losing or gaining money? Is there some new product seducing your customers? This lever is called interactive control. This means you talk to your innovators and communicate honestly and clearly about your perceptions of what's happening in the market. You encourage them to share their ideas and make plans together for the future. That is the end of section four. You